with all of my heart with all of my heart and i will praise you i will praise with you with all of my strength all my strength i will seek you i will seek you all of my days all of my days and i will follow all of your ways I will give and I will give you all my worship and I will give you all my praise cause you know I long to worship you alone are worthy of I will bow down. I will bow down and hail you as king. And hail you as king. And I will serve you. I will serve you. Give you everything. I'll give you everything. I will lift up. I will lift up my eyes to your throne. My eyes to your throne. And I trust you I will trust you I will trust you alone I'll trust in you alone and I will give you all my worship I will give you all my praise you alone I long to worship you alone are worthy of I will give you all my praise. You alone, I long to worship. You alone, sing that one more time. I will give you all my worship. I will give you all my praise. You alone, I long to worship. You alone are worthy of my praise. You can have a seat if you'd like. Sing Lord of all creation. Lord of all creation. Of water, earth, and sky. Heavens are your tabernacle. Glory to the Lord on high. Sing that again. And Lord of all creation, of water, earth, and sky. The heavens are your tabernacle. Glory to the Lord on high, God of wonders beyond our galaxy, you are holy, holy, universe declares your majesty, you are holy. Celebrate the light. And when I stumble in the darkness, I will call your name by night. God of wonders beyond our galaxy, you are holy. Declares your majesty. 
majesty you are holy holy lord of heaven and earth lord of heaven and earth lord of heaven and earth, heaven and earth. sing hallelujah and hallelujah to the lord Lord and precious Lord reveal your heart to me Father holy holy the universe declares your majesty you are holy holy
sing that one more time. Make it a prayer. And I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. So search my heart, look deep within my That might keep me from hearing you, Lord. Let me keep me from knowing you, Lord. Let me keep me from loving you, dear Lord. So search my heart and search my. Deep within my soul, see if there be anything at all that might keep me from hearing you, Lord, let me keep me from. much again. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, moving in this place. I worship you. I worship you. Keep light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. Thank you, Lord. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keep light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. You are here, touching it. I worship you, I worship you, you are here, mending every heart, I worship 
worship you. I worship you. You are here, turning lives around. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, mending every heart. I worship you. I worship you. Let's all stand. Because you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. For you are. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. 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 are. Let's sing this and believe it this morning. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop. Sing it one more time. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Cause you're the way maker, miracle worker, a promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Cause you're the way maker, miracle work a promise keep light in the darkness my god that is who you are father we thank you that even when we can't perceive it even when it doesn't feel like it even at times when it doesn't look like it, you are at work in our world. It really is the only hope for humanity and the creation itself that you are at work. Through imperfect people who blow it over and over again, and yet you use us to accomplish your purposes. What an amazing reality that we live in, Father. And Father, we pray that this morning, we're going to actually see this reality this morning, that you're working even when it doesn't look like it, even when to the early church it certainly didn't feel like it. You were behind the scenes causing the advance of the gospel to continue to go forth. And we pray, Father, that's what you'd be doing in our own lives this morning. You would be deepening us, deepening in us the reality that you're using us despite how it feels at times. So we open up your word with confidence this morning, and we ask once again that your Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts and to our minds, transforming us into the very image of Christ. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys can have a seat. Good morning. If you have your Bibles, open them up to Matthew. (laughs) Matthew chapter 9. I thought about where I was going to, there were several passages. But for time constraints, I'm just going to have you open to the Matthew 9 passage. So Matthew chapter 9. You know, it was, there was almost an instantaneous realization that when Jesus and his disciples came on the scene in Israel, there was this realization that they didn't conform, they didn't fit in to the relig- religious system of the day. The people around them, the people who, were, who grew up in Judaism, they saw Jesus and his disciples as nonconformists. 
they saw them as irreligious, as unspiritual people who didn't keep all of their traditions, who didn't keep all of their rules, who didn't seem to fit in to what was taking place within Judaism at the time. Again, they were considered unspiritual. They, because his guys, the disciples, they didn't uphold all of the religious traditions that had been built onto the system. And because they didn't do this, this bothered those who found their identity in religion and who prided themselves on keeping the religious traditions. Again, Jesus and his guys, they were considered unspiritual. And in Matthew chapter 9, some of John the Baptist's disciples and some Pharisees, they came to Jesus and they asked him why he and his disciples weren't keeping all of the traditions, weren't keeping all of the rules. And in asking, what they're really doing is criticizing them. You ever been asked a question and you felt underneath it, hey, they're not really just asking me a question. They're actually criticizing me by asking this question. Has that ever happened to you? That's, that's the feeling you got to have when this question gets asked. They're asking the question, but what they're really doing is criticizing Jesus. And look at the question, verse 14 in Matthew chapter 9. Then the disciples of John came to Jesus saying, Why do we, why do we and the Pharisees fast often? But your disciples, they don't fast at all. How come we're fasting and you're not fasting? And so Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is, is with them? Now he says, are my disciples, when the bridegroom, by the way, the bridegroom is a reference, Old Testament reference to the Lord himself. And he's saying, should my guys be mourning when the bridegroom is with them? No, he says, the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch tears away from the garment, and a worse tear is made. Neither is new wine put into old wineskins. If it is, the skins burst, and the wine is spilled and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wine skins so that both are preserved. So these guys come and they say, hey, how come you're not doing all the stuff that we're doing? How come you're not keeping all of the rules? And Jesus tells them that God's actually doing a new work through Judaism, or through Jesus. God's doing a new work through Jesus and the old forms of Judaism. And all of the religious traditions that have been added onto it, that have kind of latched onto it, like barnacles under a boat, the old forms of Judaism simply won't be able to contain the new work that God is doing through Jesus. And this is what he's saying. He says, God's doing a brand new work. And the old wineskins of Judaism and the old forms of religious traditions, they can't contain the life and the power of the gospel. New wine need new, needs new wineskins, or else it'll burst at the seams, and all the wine will spill out. And for the first two years of the early church's existence, this new work of God, the life of Christ inside of his people, what it's been doing is it's been growing. We've seen this in the book of Acts. It's been growing and expanding within apostate Judaism. And the religious system, they can't stand it. They've been trying to stop it, but they haven't been able to. And it's in our text this morning that we're going to look at in Acts chapter 6. You can go ahead and turn there if you want. It's in our text this morning where we're going to see the old wineskins of Judaism burst. They're just going to completely burst, and the new life of Christ spill out and go forth from Jerusalem into Judea and Samaria, just as the Lord said it was going to happen, back in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. So, Acts chapter 6 is where we're going to be this morning, and I'll turn there as well. Acts chapter 6, and as you're turning, let me remind you um, that we're at a turning point in the, in the book of Acts this morning. Up until now, the first 
six and a half chapters, the church is made up exclusively of Jewish people in Jerusalem. And the, and the key figure up until now in Jerusalem has been Peter. And the key figure for the future expansion of the church into the greater world, into the wider world, will be Paul. But the key figure in the turning point is not an apostle. He's uh, an ordinary believer who seeks to serve the Lord at whatever capacity is needed at the moment. And the, the man's name is Stephen. And we met Stephen last week in the first part of chapter 7. Remember, he was one of the seven men who was chosen to oversee the daily distribution of the food to needy widows. He was one of, the, one of the men who the congregation recognized as having a good reputation and being full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. And these accounts in the book of Acts are the only places in Scripture where Stephen is mentioned. But again, he's described as a man that's full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. And then later, as a man, again, full of grace and power. And Luke, who writes the book of Acts, he zooms in on Stephen in Acts chapter 6 and Acts chapter 7. And the reason he zooms in on him is because the spread of the gospel is linked directly to Stephen's life, witness, and death. The the spread of the gospel going out from Jerusalem is linked specifically to Stephen's life, witness, and death. So Acts chapter 6, and we're going to be working through the longest section and the longest speech in the book of Acts. It's a huge chunk of scripture that tells the story of Stephen and the spread of the gospel, and it breaks down nicely into four parts. So if you're a note taker, take note of these. First, what we'll see in verses 8 through 15 of chapter 6, 8 through 15, is the charges that are brought before Stephen. Stephen gets accused of of two dramatic things. He gets accused of speaking against the temple, and he gets accused of speaking against uh, the Mosaic law. So two huge accusations. That's in verses uh, 8 through 15, charges that are brought before him. And then second, in chapter 7, verses 1 through 53, so you can pray for me, 53, actually we have, I think it's 70 verses today. In verses 1 through 53, the history of God's activity, this is the the theme, the history of God's activity defends him. So first, 8 through 15, you got the charges that are brought before him. 1 through 53, you have the history of God's activity defends him. What he will do is he will trace 900 years of Israel's, of God's activity with Israel to state his case. Then verses 54 through 60, you, you will see the Son of God welcomes him. As Stephen is dying, he sees this vision of the exalted Christ. And the Son of God welcomes him. And then lastly, in verses um, 1 through 4, <laughs> in Acts chapter 8, 1 through 4 in Acts chapter 8, we see the word of God spreads because of him. So let's have a look, beginning in verse 8 of chapter 6. And again, we're going to move quickly. So Stephen, Luke tells us this in verse 8. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. So Stephen, he, he's able to perform miracles just like the apostles at this point. Um, He was designated by the apostles. He's able to perform miracles and wonders just like the apostles. And again, this is not something that everybody did. But because he was able to do this in this season, um, because of these miracles, he's gaining a strong and receptive hearing for the truth of the gospel. And so, verse 9, So uh, then some of those who belong to the synagogue of the freedmen as it was called, uh, those of Cyrene and of the Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia, they rose up and disputed, uh, disputed with Stephen. So these are Jewish men who had been enslaved and then granted their freedom. That's why they're called synagogue of the freedmen. And they came from these different, uh, these different regions, Cilicia and Alexandria, 
and they came um, in Asia, they came and they, part of the synagogue, they started arguing with Stephen. But, verse 10, they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. So they're arguing with Stephen, but Stephen's winning the argument because they couldn't match the wisdom and the spirit with which he was arguing. So he apparently had the spiritual gift of arguing. Um, and some of you may be thinking, I always knew that was a spiritual gift. That's my spiritual gift. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, that's not actually a spiritual gift, but, but he was awfully good at it. He was good at defending the faith, and that is a spiritual gift. To be able to defend the faith winsomely and persuasively, that is a spiritual gift. And Stephen was good at this. These guys couldn't match the caliber of his arguments. And so they do what we see politicians do all the time. If you can't match wits with somebody, you sling mud at somebody. And this is what they end up doing. Look at verse 11. Then they secretly instigated men who said, notice this is, I mean, people do not change. This is how, this is how everything works in our culture. If you can't win, win with wit, you instigate other people. Then they secretly instigated men who, who said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes. And they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. So again, he's brought, just like the apostles before him, he's brought before the, San, the Sanhedrin, the religious ruling body of Israel. He's brought right before him. Verse 13, and they set up false witnesses who said this. Here's the accusation. This man never ceases to speak words against this holy place. Referencing the temple. He, he never seems to stop speaking against this holy place and against, uh, and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. Now look at the trumped up charges that they bring against Stephen, that they level against Stephen here. These are incredibly serious charges because for the Jews, nothing was more sacred and precious to them than the temple. Nothing was more sacred and precious than their temple and the law. The temple in their, in their thinking, which was true up to a point, the temple um, was, the, was the holy place where God's presence dwelt. And the law was, was the holy scripture the revelation of God's will. And since the temple was God's house and the law was God's word, to speak against any, either one of those things um, would have been a high crime. But to be accused of speaking against both was blasphemy in their mind of the highest order. And so these, what these false witnesses do, note what they do, by the way. They, they, they take some of Stephen's teaching and they say, this is what Jesus has taught. They, they, well, what must have he has said, Stephen has said, to be accused of this? What must have Stephen said about Jesus' work to be accused of these things? Because what these false witnesses do is they take the truth of Christ's work and they twist it. Because Christ didn't destroy the temple. What he did, however was completely replace it. He essentially rendered it obsolete. Why? Well, because Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, which means the entire sacrificial system that the temple was built upon, it becomes obsolete. You don't need to go to the temple any longer. You don't need to keep offering sacrifices after sacrifices after sacrifices because Christ is the ultimate sacrifice that all the sacrifices pointed to. And you can now come into God's presence without going to the temple. You simply come to Christ. See how freeing this is for a, a Jewish person? But again, they loved their temple. They, they viewed their identity with God was mediated through the temple. 
And Stephen's saying, no, it's, it's no longer this way. You don't need to keep coming to the temple. You don't need to keep offering the sacrifices. You simply need to come to Christ. And Christ's second accusation about the law, Christ didn't come to abolish the law. What he did, however, is completely fulfill the law. And when you come to him, he gives you his record of obedience. So you don't need to uh, perform the works of Moses in order to save yourself. No, no, no. Jesus saves you completely. Jot down um, Romans chapter 10. Romans 10 verse 4. It's where Paul says, it's a beautiful verse. Paul says, for Christ is the end of the law. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So you simply come to Christ. Once you come to Christ, you don't have to go back to the law and keep all of its rules and keeps all of its regulations to make yourself more spiritual. You don't have to do that at all. You simply come to Christ and you let his life fill you and move you. The internal workings of the Holy Spirit is moves you, it moves you to keep the law of Christ, the law of love. You can simply rest in Christ who has fulfilled the law for you. And so Stephen, he, as he told of Christ, this radical nature of life in Christ, what it did is it stripped the gears of the religious leadership. Because life in Christ, think about it, is profoundly different than any other religious system. Human religion is primarily external. It's primarily physical. It's primarily work-based. It's what you do to earn your righteousness, work off your debt, make yourself acceptable to whatever God you're trying to appease. And you never know if you've done enough. So you never have security. You never have confidence. You never have lasting love. But new covenant life in Christ, what Stephen was obviously communicating, it's completely different. Because it's not external, it's internal. It's not physical, it's spiritual. The Holy Spirit living inside of you. It's not works-based, it's grace-based. It's the work of another, Christ Jesus, given to you freely. And you're made acceptable to God forever, which gives you unbelievable confidence, unbelievable security, and un an unbelievable sense of lasting love. There's nothing you can do to lose it. This, see what's happening here is this new life in Christ, it's bursting the seams of Judaism. And so they, they trump up these false charges against Stephen and they accuse him of speaking against the temple, speaking against the law. And what happens in verse one of chapter seven, the high priest, who's probably Caiaphas at this point, he looks at Stephen and he says, are these things so? Are these things true? And starting in verse 2, we have Stephen's defense. And we don't have time to cover it verse by verse, or we'd be here all afternoon. Um, so I'm going to just highlight the main points of it. And what Stephen's going to do is this. Again, I, I mentioned this earlier. He's going to cover 900 years of Israel's history. From Abraham, the father of Israel, to the patriarchs, highlighting Joseph, to Moses... Israel's uh, ruler and redeemer to David, the great king. To, what, and what he's going to do by highlighting all this, he's going to show uh, that God's presence wasn't limited to any particular place. Remember, one of the charges against him was um, you're speaking against the temple. And he's going to say, well, look at God's activity. It was never centered in the temple. God's activity was never centered in the temple. His presence was wherever his people are. Now, please catch that. His presence, God's presence, is wherever his people are. And then secondly, what he's going to do is he's going to show them that he wasn't disobedient to God's law. But at every point, the people of Israel have been. At every point, he's going to say, actually, I haven't been disobedient, but you may have been. Actually, he's going to say it much more strongly than that at the very end. He's, saying, he's going to say, you, you've been disobedient all the way along because you've failed to recognize God's deliverers that he sent over and over and over again. You've failed to recognize 
God's activity through these people. And now you've actually killed, at the very end he'll say, now you've actually killed the ultimate deliverer, the ultimate redeemer. So let's have a look. Um, the first accusation against him was against the temple. Um, and so he starts speaking against the temple, or he starts speaking about what God has done. And what he's going to say is God was always on the move, always on the march, always calling his people forward and directing them. So look at what he says about Abraham. Verse 2, Stephen said this, brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory, by the way, note the brothers and, and, brothers and fathers. He's identifying himself uh, as a fellow Jew, uh, as a uh, fellow partaker of the promise to Abraham. Brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham. Underline our father. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran, and said to him, go out from your land and from your kindred and go into the land that I will show you. And then he went out from the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran. And after his father died, God removed him from there into this land in which you are now living. Yet he gave him no inheritance in it, and not even a foot's length, but promised to give it to him as a possession and to his offspring after him, though he had no child. And God spoke to this effect, that his offspring would be sojourners in a land belonging to others who would enslave them and afflict them 400 years. But I will judge the nation that they serve, said God. And after that, they shall come out and worship me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac became the father of Jacob and Jacob of the 12 patriarchs. Okay, note, where did God appear to Abraham at? Mesopotamia. You know where Mesopotamia is? That's modern day Iraq. So was it, in the, was it in Israel? Was it in Jerusalem? No, it was in modern day Iraq. While Abraham and his family worshiped other gods. Even, so what he's saying is even in an idolatrous context, context even in, in a, a land that was filled with idolatry, God appeared to Abraham and spoke to him and called him forth to Haran. And then from Haran, called him on to his next stage of his journey to Canaan. Now Stephen's point, he's saying God's presence isn't bound to a specific place. God's presence isn't bound to a specific place. It's not bound to a place. God's presence is bound to a people. And by the way, this is one of the things we've had to be reminded of through the COVID crisis, is it not? That God's presence isn't bound to a place. It's bound to his people. And if we can gather, that's praise God, that's wonderful. But if we're not able to gather for a season because of the COVID crisis, we remember and we rejoice that his presence isn't bound to a place. It's bound to a people. It's bound, it's in you, in the name of Christ, through the living spirit. It's bound in you. And this is what Stephen's point is. He's saying, before there was a holy place, there was a holy people to whom God had pledged himself. And he had pl promised them that he would guide them and guard them in their pilgrimage. And from there, Stephen transitions from Abraham to Joseph, the second great figure in the uh, Old Testament. Look at what he says, verse 9. And, oh man, I wish we had time to tell the story of Joseph. The patriarchs, jealous of Joseph sold him into Egypt. But note this verse, but God was with him and rescued him out of all of his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom before Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who made him ruler over Egypt and over all his household. Now you gotta remember the story of Joseph. Uh, Joseph was the brother who was chosen to lead. He was the youngest brother, but God had chosen him to lead. 
But his brothers didn't recognize the calling on Joseph. They actually, when he came and told them, they despised him. And they rejected him. But later, they were rescued by him. And Joseph was vindicated. Does that sound like anybody else? Brothers who didn't recognize him, rejected him, and then later were saved by him and vindicated? That sounds a lot like Christ. Remember the prologue to John's gospel. He came to his own and his own did not recognize him. It sounds just like, just like Jesus. This is what Stephen's saying. He's, he's building this case. You've rejected, you've always rejected the ones that have been raised up by God to deliver you. This is what he's saying with Joseph. So the sons of Israel, you know the story. They sold him into slavery where he's carted off to Egypt. But what does it say? It says that God went with him. And not only that, but that God rescued him and blessed him. And through Joseph, God saved Joseph's family during the, fam- uh, during the famine. Again, God's presence and his, his, uh, his sense of belonging, his blessing, it wasn't limited to a specific place. It went with God's people into even such a polytheistic culture as Egypt. Now what happens in verses 17 through 43, Stephen begins to uh, talk about Moses. And he divides the story of Moses into, f- into three 40-year periods. He spends a lot of time speaking about Moses, because remember, one of the things they accused him of was speaking, against, um, was speaking against Moses. And so he shows them that he honors Moses actually a lot more than they do, because he, he's the one who acted on Moses' promise while they didn't. So um, Stephen starts in verse 17 by telling how God kept his promise to Abraham by giving him numerous descendants while Israel was enslaved in Egypt, but that a new king arose who forced the Israelites to throw out their newborn babies. And so it was at this, when Israel's sufferings were greatest and their prospects the the, uh, bleakest, that Moses, their God-appointed deliverer, was born. Again, it sounds just like another time in Israel's history. Like when Christ was born, and Herod the king tried to kill him but he was miraculously preserved. And then what Stephen does is he tells how, um, he tells how uh, Moses was not only miraculously preserved, but he was raised and educated in Pharaoh's palace. And then look at verse 23. When he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them being wrong, he defended him, He defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. He supposed that his brothers would understand, that they would recognize that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. And on the following day, he appeared to them as they were quarreling and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brothers. Why do you wrong each other? But the man who was wronging his neighbor thrust him aside saying, who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you, do you again see what Stephen's saying? He's saying Israel failed to recognize and to acknowledge Moses. They, they failed to recognize Moses' God-given vocation to rescue them. And instead of realizing that God was bringing them salvation by Moses, uh, they rejected him by saying, who made you a ruler and a judge over us? And with that, Moses, if you know the story, he fled into Midian for the next 40 years. Skip down to verse 30. Now, when 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai, in a flame of fire in a bush. When Moses saw it, he was amazed at the sight, and he drew near to look. There came the voice of the Lord. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, and of Isaac, and of Jacob. And Moses trembled and did not dare to look. And then the Lord said to him, Take off the sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is what? It's holy ground. 
I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their groanings, and I have come down to deliver them. And now I will send you to Egypt. (laughs) There's so much here. But notice how God said to him that the place where he was standing, out in the middle of the desert of Midian, that place was holy because God's presence was there. Again, what Stephen is saying, please catch this, is there's holy ground outside of the holy land. Wherever God is and his people are, that's holy. Now, what does that mean about your house? What does that mean about your interactions with your kids? It means that place is a sacred space. It means right there, it's to be a a holy house. It's to be a holy place where the Lord is communicated. Wherever God's people are and God's presence is, that place is holy. What does that do for the mission of God's people? Yeah, it's this expansive. What it does is it propels you out because it means wherever I'm at, If I'm doing the work of God, that's holy work. It's a holy space, which means I can go into whatever culture, whatever country, and the Lord could use me right there. See, what's happening here is, is Stephen is laying the groundwork in the minds of his hearers that the gospel is going to go out. It's going to be thrust out of Jerusalem into other regions, and it's going to change the lives of other people. This is what Stephen's saying. He's building this case. And notice... The same God who met Moses in Midian was also present in Egypt because he said he's seen his people's oppression and he's heard their groanings. Verse 35, this Moses, Stephen continues, this Moses whom they rejected. Again, catch this. Israel has always rejected God's deliverers. This Moses whom they rejected saying, who made you a ruler and a judge? This man, God sent as both a ruler and redeemer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. Stephen is, he is really putting his neck out there now. He's saying this Moses was God's appointed ruler and redeemer by God himself. And again, you've rejected him. You've continued to reject him. You've you've again, Israel, you've failed to recognize God's appointed uh, redeemers. Verse 36 This man led them out, performing wonders and signs in Egypt and at the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. This is the Moses who said to the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. So Moses makes this declaration that God's going to raise up another one, another prophet like him who will lead his people, who will save his people, who will deliver his people, guide his people into freedom, out of bondage, into freedom. And we'll see what um, Stephen's going to say, I've acted on this promise, and you haven't. Look at verse, um, well, keep going. Um, Verse 38. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him at Mount Sinai and with our fathers. He received the living oracles to give to us. Notice how he describes the law, the living oracles. So this accusation that he's speaking against the law, Stephen says, oh no, that's not true. I'm calling them the living oracles to give to us. Our fathers, however, refused to obey him, but thrust him aside. And in their hearts, they turned to Egypt, saying to Aaron, make for us gods who will, who will go before us. As for this Moses who led us out from the land of Egypt, we don't know what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days and offered a sacrifice to the idol and were rejoicing in the works of their hands. Again, Stephen's saying, you guys have rejected Moses' leadership and then you commissioned Aaron to make, to make substitute gods who you gave yourself to in, uh, in idolatry. 
So now look at what he's done. He's traced the life and ministry of Moses through its time in Egypt, Midian, in the wilderness, and shown that in each, in each period and in each place, God was with him. God was completely with him, thus stressing God's presence wasn't limited to a building, not limited to a, a place. And now what happens in verse 44 through 50, uh, Stephen, how much time do I got? Oh my gosh. <sighs> well, we'll just talk faster. In uh, 44 through 15, he's going to talk, Stephen's going to talk about how when he was in the wilderness, or when Moses was in the wilderness, uh, God directed him to build the tent of meeting, the tabernacle. And they brought it with them into the promised land. And it wasn't until the monarchy, um, it wasn't until the monarchy was established that David had the idea to build the temple. But it was Solomon who actually constructed it. And Stephen says, look at verse 48. He says, yet the most high does not dwell in houses made by hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Did not my, did not my hand make all these things? He quotes Isaiah 66 and is essentially saying, while the temple is great, God can't be contained in a building. God can't be contained and confined to an earthly temple. He's not restricted to one place. God's presence goes where God's people are. God's presence is wherever God's people are. That's where he lives. So that's his counter argument for the first accusation that he's speaking against the temple. But remember, they also accused him of speaking against the law and altering the customs of Moses. And in each four of the periods that he's gone through, that we've just looked at, in each of the four periods that he's gone through, he's shown them how he wasn't the one who disrespected the law. He wasn't the one who disrespected Moses. It was the Israelites who had disrespected the law and refused Moses all the way through. They were the people who failed to recognize Moses as their ruler and redeemer. It was they who thrust him aside after receiving the law. It was they who rejected his leadership and who refused to obey him, instead letting their hearts turn back to Egypt. And do you remember what they asked Aaron to do while Moses was up on the mountain receiving the law? To make substitute gods for them. That's what they asked Aaron to do, make substitute gods for us. And what's the first law in the Ten Commandments? You shall have no other gods before me. So who really disobeyed the law? Israel. Israel had repeatedly disobeyed the law. And now what happens after exposing Israel's unfaithfulness to the law, unfaithfulness to the prophets, Stephen, what he does is he goes for the counter indictment and he drops a massive bomb on their heads. Look at verse 51. Look at what he says. He says, you stiff-necked people. This is to the Sanhedrin. The super religious guys, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in your heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Underline the word your there. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. Wow! This is, this is not how to make friends and influence people. This is just a massive bomb on their heads. By calling them stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, Stephen was implying that all these really religious guys were actually outside of the covenant of God. They were outside of the covenant of God and they were pagans at heart. And they were deaf to the truth of God's word. Oh, you can't say anything more offensive than this. You're uncircumcised in your heart. You're a pagan at your heart and you're deaf to the truth of God's word. And that they, just like their forefathers before them, they resisted the Holy Spirit and they rejected God's representatives. But even worse, he says, 
they murdered the ultimate redeemer. They've murdered the ultimate rescuer by crucifying Christ. Look at what he does. He, he, takes their count, he takes their argument and he flips it on its head and he lays it down at their feet and says, oh no, what you've been accusing me of is actually what you've been guilty of all the way along. I'm not the one who's guilty of these things. You are. You've rejected God's work once again. And look at what happens. You know, if you know the story, verse 54, now when they heard these things, they were mildly surprised. No, when they heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him like a pack of wild dogs. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at his right hand of God. And he said, behold, I see the heavens opened. Remember, he's speaking this right before the Sanhedrin. Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man, Jesus' favorite title to himself, the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. He's saying, oh no, Jesus is vindicated. You thought you killed him. He's alive and he's been exalted. He's at the right hand of God, the Father, the place of ultimate authority. And he's standing as my advocate and your judge. You thought you were going to come here and judge me today. Jesus is actually judging you for disrespecting him and killing him. Jesus is the judge and you're under his condemnation. Look at what happens, verse 57. But they cried out with a loud voice, and stopped their ears, put their hands over their ears, they're yelling, hands over their ears, and they rushed together at him. And then they cast him out of the city, and they stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now look at this, he, he quotes almost verbatim Jesus' words from the cross. Lord, don't, don't hold this sin against them. What enables him to suffer so well? Have you ever thought about this? Why? Well, how, why is he able to suffer so well? Here's why. Because he's more concerned with the glory of God the Father than his own glory. And to the degree that Jesus is, you're more enamored by Jesus' glory than your own glory is to the degree that you'll be able to suffer well. If, all, if, if your whole perspective of life is, I need to attain glory for myself, then when suffering comes your way, it will crush you, will absolutely crush you. But if your whole orientation of your life is, I live to bring glory to Jesus Christ, then when suffering comes your way, you'll be able to bear up under it and suffer well because Jesus himself suffered for you. This is why Stephen's able to suffer well. To, to the degree that you're enamored with Jesus' glory is to the degree that you'll be able to suffer well. This is why Stephen, as he's being stoned, think about this large boulders hitting him in the head and he's able to say, Jesus, forgive them. Lord, do not hold their sin against them. This is remarkable. Verse, uh, last part of verse 60. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now, put yourself in the shoes of the early church. You've been a part of this little gathering for two years. It keeps growing, keeps growing. More opposition comes as it continues to grow. Would you see this as a good thing? Would you see this as a as a as as a as a positive thing for your little group? Would you see this as a good thing for the gospel, or would you see this as a major setback for the gospel? Because this appears to be a major setback for the gospel. But what we see in verses one through four of one through four of chapter eight, it is that it was actually used by the Lord to advance the gospel. Look at verse one. And Saul approved of his execution, and there arose on that day a great persecution. I'm sorry, Saul approved of his execution, 
And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And because God's presence and power is within his people, uh, his presence and power is not bound to a place, the gospel goes with them into Judea and Samaria, just as the Lord said it would. Look at verse 4. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. So the gospel goes into Judea and Samaria as these believers get thrust out with the knowledge that wherever they go, the Lord goes with them. And the Lord's spirit enables them to communicate his word. Okay, let's stop right there. So Stephen, what he does is he sets the stage for the advance of the gospel into other regions because he's made it perfectly clear that God's presence is wherever God's people are. It's not contained in buildings. God's presence, his power is not contained in buildings. It's not contained in traditions, but it's contained in the lives of his people. And when he calls them forth, he will go with them. His life, his power, his presence goes with them. And we'll see how this plays out uh, the next time we gather. But what I want to do, a little bit of time, a oh, little bit of time I have left. I want to pull on just three strands of, of Stephen's life, witness, and death and see what they tell us. Three strands. Stephen's life, witness, and death. They remind us of three things. Here's the first one. Stephen's life reminds us that the Lord will give you exactly what you need to bear witness of him in the midst of your crisis. The Lord will give you exactly what you need to bear witness of him in the midst of your crisis. And again, remember who Stephen was. He was not an apostle. He um, was someone who wasn't even from the, the, the Jewish culture, wasn't raised in the religious culture. He was a Hellenist. He was someone who was from a Greek culture that was converted to Judaism. And then when he heard the gospel, he came under the lordship of Christ. So an ordinary person from a different culture gets saved by Christ and the Lord uses him powerfully. He was an ordinary spirit-filled believer who sought to serve the Lord in whatever capacity was needed. And this was no doubt the biggest challenge, the biggest crisis of his life. But the Lord gave him exactly what he needed to stand up under it and to bear witness of Jesus. The Lord gave him peace, strength, calm, confidence, wisdom in the words he needed. And here's the glorious thing, Christian friend, he will do the same for you. I don't know what crisis you're going through, but the Lord promises through his spirit that he will give you exactly what you need to bear up under it and to witness well for the cause of Christ. And the question is, do you really believe that? Do you believe that the Holy Spirit will give you what you need to bear up under whatever crisis you're going through and represent the Lord well? You should. You should believe this because Jesus in, in Luke chapter 21, jot down Luke 21 verses 12 through 15 and look them up over lunch or breakfast in your case. Jesus said Luke 21, he says, he tells us the guys, they will lay hands on you and persecute through you. They will deliver you to the synagogues and prisons and you will be brought before kings and governors in all account, all because of, uh, on account of my name. But make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourself. Why? He goes on, he says, For I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. Here's the deal. When you're walking with Jesus, his Holy Spirit within you, which is not bound to a building or to a place, his Holy Spirit within you will give you what you need to bear witness to him, to his name. Even in the most challenging crisis, this is what the Lord did for Stephen. And Stephen's life reminds us that the Lord will do that for us as well. Now, Stephen's witness, it reminds us, Stephen's witness reminds us that the Lord is much more concerned with our faithfulness than our effectiveness. Much more concerned with our faithfulness than our effectiveness. Yet you will always find that when we're faithful, the Lord will bring the effectiveness with it. And you say, well, where do you see that in this account? It doesn't look like Stephen was all that effective. I mean, he got stoned to death. That's true, but there was a young man 
on the fringes of the debate from Cilicia, who watched and heard everything that Stephen said and did, and who became very, very important for the spread of the gospel. Look at verse 58. They, uh, they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. Saul of Tarsus, who would go on to become the apostles, the apostle Paul. And Saul's conversion isn't recorded until Acts chapter 9. But what happened is he watched and he agreed with Stephen's death. But I bet you, as he watched and as he agreed with it, something was happening in Saul's soul and his mind that Stephen would never know about this side of eternity. He, he, he never knew about it, this side of eternity. And you never know the seeds that are planted when you are faithfully bearing witness of Christ. You never know. You, so have you ever been in a conversation about the Lord Jesus Christ and you walk away from the conversation and you think, I screwed that up completely. I'm a bumbling fool. I can't believe I said these words. I feel that all the time, all, all the time. And yet the seeds that are planted, you never know. When you are faithfully bearing witness to Jesus, uh, you never know what seeds are planted. It may not even be the person you're speaking to. It may be some, to someone on the side of the conversation, the fringe of the conversation that's hearing it. And they're receiving the gospel that, mar that moment. It may, not feel, it may not feel effective. It may not look effective. And yet the Lord is using it. He's working in another person's soul through you, just as he worked in Saul's soul through Stephen. And you can rest in that. So Stephen's life, it reminds us that the Lord will give us what we need to bear witness of him in the midst of a crisis. Stephen's witness reminds us that the Lord is much more concerned with our faithfulness than our effectiveness. And yet the Lord will bring the effectiveness with it. And then lastly, Stephen's death reminds us just how good this good news really is. Stephen's death reminds us just how good this good news really is. The good news is so good that Stephen goes to his death proclaiming it. And the truth is, really good news is worth dying for. And if it's worth dying for, you flip that coin over and what it means, it means ultimately it's worth living for. How good is this news? Well, it's so good that people all over the world are going to their death, sharing it with those who are killing them. This is Stephen. This is people all over the world. It, how good is this news? It's this good. Around the world, some 300,000 people are put to death annually for their faith. Thousands are sold into slavery or sent to re-education camps. And yet, the cause of Christ continues to spread. Why? Because the gospel is true. And the good news is really this good. And as we prepare to take communion, what, you, what you're saying as you hold the elements in your hand, what you're saying is that the gospel is true. The gospel is true, and not only is it true, it's the best news that humanity has ever heard. God's presence, his power, his spirit isn't confined within a building, it's placed within his people. And wherever we go, he will give us what we need to bear witness of him. This is marvelous news, that he loves us and secures us in his blood. So, if you've got your little packet, go ahead and open it up. We'll partake of the uh, bread and the juice together. Let me pray. Father, as we hold these, uh, this little piece of bread and this little cup of juice, we are reminded that you entered into human history as a man. God became flesh so that you can rescue us from all of our sin, from all of our bondage, and free us in Christ. And Father, don't let us be like the forefathers of Israel who always rejected your deliverers. There was a moment in Stephen's speech where he says, he traced our fathers, our fathers, our fathers, and then at the very end he switched it and said, your fathers. 
because he broke from his family's history and came under the lordship of Christ. And Father, that's what we do every time we come here and we gather and we, op- we come before your table. We are declaring our love and our loyalty to you and to you alone. And we rejoice in your forgiveness and the new life you've given us in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. I'd like to skip down to the bridge of this last song, keeping in mind that the communion that we just shared that represents our allegiance to Christ and his victory on the cross, that we can sing these words with authority. And oh, death, where is your sting? And oh, hell, where is your victory? Oh, church, come stand in the light. The glory of God has defeated the night. Singing, no, death, where is your sting? Oh, hell, where is your victory? Oh, church, come stand in the light. Our God is not dead. He's alive, He's alive Cause Christ is risen from the dead Trampling over death by death Come awake, come awake Come and rise up from the grave Christ is risen from the dead We are one with Him again Come awake, come awake Come and rise up from the grave. Father, we thank you for your resurrection life. Father, we pray that as we leave here, we go back into our homes, into our neighborhoods, back into the places of work tomorrow, that your presence and your power would go with us, that you would enable us to bear witness of Christ faithfully and effectively. In Jesus' name, amen.